Uh, many people don't know about it, but the, for the reason why I left Quetzalano is uh, there was four uh, bachelor apartments above a, a, a stores. And I had one, and across the hall there was a guy that kind of was like a real stay-at-home. He had a dog. He kind of sat there. He had no company, etc. And we had a front door at that time, which was not locked, and we had communal mailbox where they would just deliver the mail. And all of a sudden, strange things started to happen to me, like I would come home and my mail had been opened, or or all of a sudden there were swastikas uh, written on my mail, including the insides. And then one day I came home and a swastika the size, the width of, of my door was painted on in big white paint. And I couldn't figure out what was happening. So I called the police and the police came by and I showed them. And It was very bizarre because the owners of the building were Jewish. And I thought, well, I don't know if I want to tell them that people are putting swastikas on their property. Maybe, I, <clears throat> maybe the door at the bottom should be locked. Or, so what I did is I, I wrote them a letter and I said, there's been problems. Uh, my door has been glued shut where I couldn't put the key in to lock my door. And I don't know who it is, but the front door, I think it should be locked from now on. And it was glass, but it should be locked. So anyways, uh, they sent around a memo that everyone should lock the doors. And so what happened is I, the day came, we all got a key. That night I came home and the door was unlocked, so I locked it. I went up to my apartment, I was having a shower, and all of a sudden I heard uh, somebody screaming, like screaming really loud. And then I heard the glass smash, the front glass smash of the door to the street and running up the stairs. And then my neighbor next door, this guy, started pounding on my door and said he was going to kill me. And basically he was outed as the guy that had been doing this. And he actually was so big and so po his rage was so powerful that he knocked the door right off our hinges, like the frame around. And it came right in and I phoned the police. I was in a panic. So the police came rushing over. And I had a friend who lived uh, not too far away, a heterosexual man that I'd known for quite a few years. And I phoned him and I said, Doug has broken into my apartment. He's, he's uh, threatening to kill me. I called the police. So he came and drove over. And the police came upstairs and there the door was broken into. This Doug guy was standing in my apartment. And the two police officers came into my apartment and said, what's going on here? And I said, well, this guy has broken into my apartment. And they said, well, why is he broken into your apartment? And I said, I don't know. You should talk to him. Uh, he just smashed my door in. Well, what did you do, right? And I said, well, here's a police report I made a f few days ago about swastikas on my doors and stuff like that. And, the guy go and one of the cops says, well, I'm not reading that. And I thought, oh boy, this is, this is really ugly. This is 1984. And uh, so what I did is uh, I said, well, I'd like to speak to you privately. He said, well, if you're not going to speak to me now, I said, then uh, we're going to leave. And I said, well, I want him out of my apartment. So they took him and went into his apartment, locked the, shut the door, and talked to him. And then came back and they said, well, are you going to talk to me now? And my friend says, let's just get the hell out of here, right? So I pulled my door kind of up, up against the frame. I couldn't lock it or anything. And we left. So we walked downstairs, and my friend had parked across the street. So my friend walked across the street, jaywalked. And I was about to jaywalk, and the police officer, one of them, yelled. He said, if you uh, walk across the street, I'll ticket you for jaywalking. So I had to go to the corner of the street, push the walk button, and I had to stand there and wait for the cross walk button to change. It was 4th Avenue, like about 1 in the morning, there was no cars. I had to stand there by myself, cross the street, go over, get in his car, and then we took off. Then the police followed us. And we went up uh, Dunbar, we turned up to, uh, 10th Avenue going all up towards UBC, and the police car was following us. And all of a sudden, we got over the hump, and my friend just pulled over and turned the lights out, and the cop car went past us. 
and then he turned the lights on, did a U-turn, and the police, you could see the brake lights come on, and they turned a U-turn to come after us. And he, he just drove really fast through side streets, and we lost the cops. Okay. So I went to Harry Rankin's office, and I didn't have an appointment. I went in, and I talked to him, and I said, is there a way that this guy should be leaving, or you know, how can we get rid of him? And Harry Rankin says, no, you leave. He says, get away from this guy. This guy's crazy. You don't want to live another day beside him. So well, I had to, uh, then I went and I phoned the owners of the apartment building and I told them everything that had happened. And um, I, uh, uh, I said, I have to move. The door's broke. He said, I'll get, I'll get him to fix the door. I said, no, I don't want him touching anything. So for three days, I left everything in my apartment with the door broken off it with this guy living across the hall. And then they said, we have another apartment building at Oak and 12th, a bachelor, why don't you move in there? So I had a whole bunch of friends came over and we all went and picked up all my stuff, everything, moved it to the other apartment building, put it in the apartment building. It was really depressing. There was, I was above the dumpster, I was on the alley, I was very depressed in this kind of basic windowless apartment. And all of a sudden I got a knock on the door and the landlords came to the door and said, oh, you're all moved in and everything. And I said, yeah. And they said, uh, well, this apartment's $50 more a month. <laughs> so I wrote them a check for $50. <laughs> it was more, yet it was worse. And I gave it to them, and fine. And then about, then that summer, I worked on Margaret Mitchell's campaign. She used to be the member of Parliament for Vancouver East. And uh, I got, uh, I, somebody was moving out of their apartment. And so October of that year, I moved in. And that's 25 years ago, I moved to Commercial Drive. So that was my way of getting to Commercial Drive. But m many people, even people that I know very well, don't know this story. But I was thinking, that's not very long ago, but how horrible that night was for me. How that changed my life. And I have to tell you, it changed my life it, up to that point. I would consider myself had been a very happy person. And it kind of, it, it took a lot of happiness out of my life. And that's what happens with gay people. They say, oh, they're so grumpy or that one. I don't know why that person's, you know, miserable all the time or whatever. But sometimes we go through things in our life as gay people that really take the juice out of us. Some people, it, it comes to the point where people become uh, so dysfunctional, they can't work. They can't make relationships. They can't have friendships. And people go through these things. And, and it's amazing how many gay people, they say, oh, and then this happened to me. Someone else will, you know, at a dinner party. And you think, how did we survive this stuff? And at that point, I said, I will never back away again. And one of my big ceremonies was, is, you know, one night I had a joint somewhere or something. And all the papers of this and the... The, the name of the police, uh, uh, badge numbers and all that stuff. I went and I burned it all, right? But I really regretted I burned it now because I really would love to have seen where are they now? Mm -hmm. And my straight friend, who is still my friend, I remember about a year ago we got together for dinner and he said, that was the night, Harry, I never knew how bad being gay was in our society. He says, it changed me forever. I couldn't believe it. So that was, um, that's how I got to commercial drive. But anyways, uh, I found out later, the guy actually did go to jail because he had criminally harassed someone else. There was a, a trade union strike and they, he was sending threatening notes to their home. But guess what the, this Doug guy, guess what his job was? A gunsmith. Oh, he worked in a gun shop on Main Street. Doesn't surprise. So talk about uh, feeling, uh, you know, like crazy with a gun, huh?